and it was really interesting at this meeting on cancer how the majority of the surgery talks were on benign disease, minimally invasive disease, and then an entirely side uh, a lecture was uh, was on uh, radio frequency ablation, and um, and then I met people uh, through through Rudy uh, who were down in Brazil, and uh, and and we uh, connected right away because the surgeon in Brazil was doing the same. Uh, transoral endoscopic surgery that I was doing and again they had a lot a lot on that talk during that meeting and so uh, immediately I was kind of hooked on this and so um, so we're going to talk about radio frequency ablation first uh, but you can't really start talking about that without first presenting this slide because everybody has to if you're going to talk about thyroid anything you always have to show this uh, American Thyroid Association slide which is the ultrasound classification of these nodules. And I think all of us who do this recognize how important it is to recognize nodules which are benign and nodules which are indeterminate and nodules which are suspicious and know how to basically uh, you know, categorize these in ways that, uh, that help us decide which way we're going with these patients because we all see patients that want one thing and they're absolutely not candidates. And we, I mean, I, I certainly see more people who want uh, minimally invasive surgery that are absolutely not candidates for it. So, um, but this is just so I just bring this up just to point this out. But you know, and over the years, you just develop your own repertoire in your head where you just can look at something and just say that that is you know highly suspicious and that versus that's clearly benign. So, and then this is just more for people who aren't you know familiar with it. But I'm just going to move through this. So the natural history of benign nodules uh, was was worked out in just recently in in Italy. They did a study looking at a thousand people, uh, and they had 1,500 nodules, and they showed that basically in these thousand people that they followed for five years, uh, that most of them just stayed the same. And, and so that's really important to know. And then obviously some of them mo some of them grew, and the ones that grew were mostly in the younger population. And then, but obviously some of them shrank. So I think this is powerful information for patients who come in and truly are asymptomatic and they have a medium-sized nodule and you can biopsy it and you can show like, look, you don't need anything, just leave it alone. Or, or the opposite, you have somebody who comes in, they got this gigantic nodule and uh, they're like, well, what should I do? I'm like, well, you know, clearly it's not, it's not gonna change much and so you're gonna still have all these symptoms. So you can start with that conversation keeping this this particular uh, study in context um, okay and then in terms of evaluating these patients there was a study back in 2008 out of Pittsburgh uh, in which they were looking at nodules that were being biopsied and they were looking at patients who had nodules over four centimeters and and they showed that in this particular one study that was presented at the AES meeting, uh, that these patients who had a nodule over four centimeter in size had a 20% chance of thyroid cancer, which, which really brought up a lot of discussion. And so this is, and again, that was in 2008. And so after that, this, this study with Peter Angelo and Dr. Grogan, they looked at patients, they looked at 7,000 patients who had fine needle aspirations and subsequently went and had surgery. And they broke them up into nodules that are three centimeters, nodules that are four centimeters, and nodules that are five centimeters. And they basically showed that in all subsets, in all groups, that the false negative rate was truly about 4%. And, and the, you know, so that these patients, you know, the 20%, you know, that was shown in that other study truly did not really apply for these patients. And that's really helpful too because, again, if a patient has a biopsy and it shows that it is benign, you know, that's, that, you know, that's helpful. And that means that patient can be followed and watched and, and, and you know, you can choose to, to operate on them, but you don't have to be alarming just based on the size of that nodule. So it all bases on their symptoms. So, now, <clears throat> I show this slide because again, when I was in, I went to Brazil to learn this, and I can tell you that going to Brazil to learn anything is very fun. <laughs> and uh, we went, and, and this lecture that I'm gonna try to do in about 30 minutes, we did in three days in Brazil. And we had lecture after lecture after lecture. Uh, but when we're, when we're talking about thyroid uh, evaluation, we're talking about usually doing fine needle aspiration cytology in the United States. Uh, but what they're saying is, you know, a lot of times you have indeterminate nodules and, and follicular lesions of undetermined significance and atypical, you know, undetermined significance. 
And what do you do? Well, you rebiopsy again, or you send, in the United States, you send genetic testing. But in Brazil, they don't do that. And in other countries, they don't do that. They do core biopsies. And I don't know why that's not part of our ATA guidelines and all, but core biopsies are shown to be eight times more specific and sensitive to det detecting true pathology. And so that's what we've started to do now, rather than do the genetic testing, is just go right to the core biopsies for some of these big nodules. They're, they're clearly big targets. It's easy to hit. Uh, with a core biopsy. You have to get kind of fast out with it, but and there's there's certain things that you need to know, like you can't send it in the cytology fluid. You gotta send it in formalin. But but it truly gets you get a lot better pathology reading with this. And so this has been really helpful uh, when patients come in and they and they, they say, Well we don't want surgery at all, what should we do? And this is what we do. We do core biopsies. So and this is another this is a close up. This lesion on the left or pardon me, on, on, on your left, is, is a follicular lesion with microfollicles, and that's a patient that is not a candidate uh, for, for non-invasive surgery, and that patient needs a you know, tumor out, whereas the one on the right is clearly benign, so. All right, so in the case for intervention, again, not to be uh, oversimplistic for those who do this every day, but choking, pressure, hoarseness, tenderness, and difficulty swallowing, so I think we all know this. Uh, but you know, some people are more symptomatic than others, and um, and uh, most patients will surprisingly live with this a long time before they decide to do anything. Particularly if their thyroid is working. Uh, but the uh, obviously if they're on medications, then clearly we'd take them to surgery sooner. So obviously you have the other patients who have cosmetic problems, and this is variable as well. And um, you know, when you go to other countries, you'll see patients who have just gigantic thyroid nodules and, and it's, a, it's really a, it's a stigma for them too uh, in these other countries because they are, uh, you know, they, the people don't understand what causes goiters to begin with. So the, the really exciting group is the hyperfunctioning nodules because these patients uh, specifically um, have um, uh, obviously a, a medical problem. Uh, they're prone to dysrhythmias and osteoporosis and they don't like taking the med. They do not like taking methimazole. They do not like having all the blood tests with this. Uh, but they also don't want the radioactive iodine ablation. And we know that the radioactive iodine ablation can cause uh, hypothyroidism in, in over 60 to 70 percent of these patients afterwards. And so the only really good treatment that prevents that is surgery, and they don't want surgery either. So, so this new uh, method, which is the RFA, it really ablates the function immediately, and and they be, they can restore their normal thyroid function, uh, you know, truly the next day. So this has been a very exciting group of, of patients that, that I that I love to see, because they come back telling you how much better they feel. So. All right, so anyway, for surgery, obviously, anything over four centimeters that was grossly visible is what we did for surgery uh, or symptoms, uh, and then typically you perform an open lobectomy or a total thyroid based upon you know how many nodules were on the other side. And then I introduced the transoral endoscopic thyroidectomy. Katie Cohn and I went to, to Bangkok, and we learned this technique uh, because I was very interested in kind of performing scarless surgery, and I loved the scarless surgery idea. I'd done the robotic cases, and I didn't like that. It, it, it was too much surgery for a long run for a short slide for those robotic cases. A lot of patients wanted it, uh, but I, I, I stopped after about, I bet did about, about eight of them, I think, and, and then I stopped. And then, uh, but we switched to transorals, which is a lot better. Uh, but since we've been doing this procedure, really uh, there's no real demand for the transoral either. So, uh, so they've definitely seen, even in Brazil where they're doing you know, loads of transoral surgery, and, and that's because the patients don't want to scar when they're on the beach, because they're, they're on the beach all the time. In 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 uh, in uh, uh, Rio de Janeiro, and so they don't want to scar, uh, and and so they do the transoral. But but since the RFA came out, there's a lot less demand for that. So the relevant concerns, of course, of surgery are obviously the cost of surgery, uh, the risk of potential complications, either permanent or even temporary. Uh, some patients are concerned about the recovery period because being off work for even three or four days is is too much for them. And, and, uh, and of course, the long-term quality of life if they don't want to take a pill every day. Or they don't want to look at and see themselves with a scar every day. And some of us minimize that, but of course, everybody's different. So um, <clears throat> uh, certainly if you're taking the whole thyroid out, this is, is a lot bigger concern. So, 
So this is the transoral vestibular approach. This would make anybody who's seen this slide not want this operation. But it's amazing because after you take the thyroid out uh, through, that, through the incision where the biggest instrument is, the trocar, uh, and, and you take all the instruments out, the neck comes, comes back to its immediate, uh, to its original form, and everybody's like, oh, that's like golf clap for that. That's, that's fantastic. So, so this has been really great for, for cosmesis again, and, and this is a good example. This patient had a big nodule on the right side, and then after her surgery, this is only a month after surgery, you see she has minimal swelling, had minimal pain after surgery. Most of these patients took, take about the same amount of medication for pain as the standard thyroid lobectomy, and she avoided an incision. And uh, so, so we like this approach for, for smaller nodules that are uh, less than five centimeters in ballpark in, in general. But again, uh, and you can do these on, on cancers and stuff, but in general I wasn't doing these on cancers. So, um, so when it comes to minimally invasive or percutaneous procedures for thyroid nodules, there's always the, uh, the chemical ablation, which in this case is gonna be percutaneous ethanol injection. And uh, Amir has, has heard me discuss this numerous times because I can't get it. Uh, this is very common in Europe. They do the, the PEI injections on thyroid cysts all the time. Uh, but I guess the United States ethanol is regulated so you don't make meth a lab in your office. And so, so you, they, they, will only, they will only give it to you if you have a CLIA certified lab, and which, I, which I personally don't have, so I can't get it. Uh, they do sell uh, these little vials of, of it uh, for 185 bucks for 5 cc's. And the interventional radiology department, they were shocked when I told them how much that they cost because they must use a lot of it. And, uh, but the, but it actually, the little vials cost more than you get paid to do the procedure. So if you can't get bulk, bulk amounts of this ethanol, it just doesn't make sense to do it. So the thermal ablation techniques are, and I have the radio frequency up top, but the most, most uh, the initial uh, uh, ablations were, used, were using laser. And laser was very popular for a while. And then radio frequency came out, and uh, a lot of the doctors switched, basically did, did both for a while, did comparative studies, and the comparative studies truly showed that laser uh, was not as good as radio frequency. They just didn't get as big, as much volume reduction. And uh, the laser equipment is, is, is more, I mean, we don't have any laser pe people here, but in general, the equipment is a little bit more expensive to maintain. Uh, and, uh, and the laser uh, uh, treatment is a little bit harder to control. Uh, and there's a lot more charring on the tip of the, of the laser. So it's not, it's really fallen out of favor. Uh, the microwave and, and high intensity uh, ultrasound, HIFU, uh, is being used in, in certain centers where they really have a high concentration of goiters. Uh, I met a radiologist in Turkey and we were at a conference in Milan talking about all these different techniques and he had done over 400 radio frequency ablations and that was about a year and a half ago and he had already done about 400 on his own and written a lot of articles and he had switched uh, his office to uh, I think the, 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 the microwave therapy which he said was fantastic but you, you have to have equipment and you certainly need the volume of patients to be able to, to uh, make up the differences because the capital equipment is extremely expensive. So uh, starting off with radio frequency, it's basically a high, uh, high uh, frequency alternating current causing uh, the uh, friction in the ionic, uh, chemical, uh, ionic, in this case, proteins. Uh, the agitation of those proteins cause heat and then the heat then disperses throughout the tissue. So you get frictional heat right specifically around the tip of the catheter, uh, but the conductive heat then spreads to the rest of the tissue. And so you first see uh, you know, a kind of a rim of changes around the, the needle, and then you'll just see it kind of change the whole, the whole area around it. So that's kind of neat. And then uh, basically the heat, which doesn't have to be boiling, uh, will, uh, will then cause uh, enough cell damage to the proteins where you get enough irreversible damage. So the, I, I talk about carbonization of tissue because charring of the tissue uh, will then cause a certain amount of insulation and, and so the heat doesn't disperse as much when you have charring. So, uh, so that's the whole point of the, the cool tip which we'll go over. Uh, so the catheter, which I will show you, is designed, they have, they have uh, several probes. One is a five millimeter probe, one's a 10 millimeter probe. Uh, that's the, the active area. So the actual probe is, um, is uh, about 10 centimeters long. And at the very tip of it is a needle, and then they also have the 
uh, the active part, which is the either the five or the ten. And most of the time, for the nodules we're seeing, um, they're they're truly big enough where you want the ten. And in fact, sometimes you want even bigger than that, just to kind of make it kind of go along a little faster. Uh, and so uh, you, you can you have to position and reposition this catheter, and I'll and I'll show you. And, and they you, you, know, you can call it a catheter, but it's really a, a probe. So the, this specific one that's designed for the thyroid has an internal heating, pardon me, cooling system, uh, which, which again keeps the needle from getting too hot. Uh, because again, if it gets too hot, then it, when you turn it on, it'll stick to the tissue and you won't be able to move it. It'll just get in there and you turn it on and it gets stuck. So you have to keep it cool and then the process of keeping it cool the, uh, the, the tissue, the actual heat will disperse a little further uh, through the tissue to make it even that much more effective. So, so we talk about benign thyroid nodules. This is a great nodule. We wish all of them were like this, and that's because I don't have a pointer. Do I have a pointer on this, Jade? Or a root? There we are. So on this particular uh, thyroid, you have a nice rim, a normal th tissue all the way down in here, and the nerve would be right in here. And so this would be a fantastic one to ablate if it were big enough. It's actually quite small, uh, but if this patient were symptomatic for, from a bigger one, it would be perfect because you can put a needle right in this direction, right from here, right into this nozzle, and you start down here and you just basically ablate it on several passes, and then you don't have any problems with the nerve. And, and we call it the, tran the transismic approach, and I'll show you here. Uh, but we'll get back to that in a minute. So, but anyway, this is a great no this is a great nodule to ablate, and I'll, we'll keep we'll go to techniques a little bit later. So, uh, it was, this was all really started in Korea uh, by a doctor named uh, Dr. Juan Beck, and he started this back in 2002, and I think he was started to publish things in about 2006. But here in 2012, they already had this giant uh, guidelines in Korea about the the appropriate. Um, uh, patients to do and what you do in certain circumstances for these patients to d basically saying that it's completely appropriate to do benign thyroid nodules in this situation but but at the time and we're still not doing uh, indeterminate nodules this way um, and then but and, and in Korea they're doing recurrent cancers this way in patients who've had significant amount of surgery and and, it, and because they've had so much surgery that the RFA is believed to be less uh, risky for the patient in terms of complications than uh, then then going in for a third or fourth time so um, but I mean they they've even revised these guidelines several times you know so like it was what I think we got our our, our uh, uh, equipment here approved by the FDA right in 2000 in uh, December November 2019 18. 2018 and uh, and then even after that here it is 2021 and we still don't have uh, it out on you know for for common use yet it's not approved even though it's approved for use it's not accepted by the common in the industry which in court in this case is insurance so <clears throat> and now in Italy they're using it too I mean all of Europe is using this uh, England's using it and, and so you know obviously Brazil so the, the candidates for RFA are basically patients who are symptomatic uh, they, they, a lot of patients are, are not symptomatic, but their nodules are just so big that they just they think we just really ought to take care of this. But the nodule has to be bigger than two centimeters. It, it's helpful if it's growing that it, you just basically can tell the patient it's going to keep growing. Um, and then thyroid cysts, you can treat thyroid cysts with this, but you really wouldn't do it first line of, 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 of care because it's very expensive to do this procedure, whereas the alcohol is very cheap. So you definitely do uh, ethanol injection first, and that's really the, the recognized treatment of thyroid cysts. So uh, you have to biopsy, obviously, the wall of the cyst to make sure it's not cancer. Uh, basically, cosmetic visibly, visible nodules are, are good candidates for this. And in this case, you need uh, two biopsies. Any any time you have a, a nodule that's that, that you're going to treat with this, you want two benign, not you know, biopsies, unless you can prove that it's a hyperfunctioning nodule, um, and it, in which case you only need one. So the different techniques uh, for this have been and are the, the fixed ablation. Now, fixed ablation is a technique mostly used for like the lung, and kidney, and and um, um, uh, and um, liver tumors, where basically you put in a catheter into the middle of the nodule and then you deploy kind of these expanding hooks uh, that would go a certain diameter 
And, and then that uh, catheter is then heated up and it ablates the whole thing all at one time. Well, you can't really do that with thyroid for, for various reasons. It's hard to uh, get that, 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 that fix, that those hooks to expand in an appropriate way where you can truly get all the nodule because nodules aren't always perfect circles. And also, um, you, those hooks can get outside the nodule and could potentially get down in the tracheoesophageal groove and damage your nerve. And so it's, it's never really been successful. And plus, if patients don't tolerate it, uh, then it's hard to reposition. So the moving shot technique basically is you, you put the, the catheter at the lowest point of the thyroid, and then you start treating from lowest to highest. And that's because once you start treating, you can't really see through that area that you're treating. The, the tissue no longer has its normal appearance on ultrasound, and the, the ultrasound waves do not transmit through that very effectively. So you start the deepest and move more superficially, and again, you avoid the tracheal salvageal groove you know, to avoid any sign of to any, get any hoarseness. And this is the, the example. So you, you go through the isthmus, and, and the reason why you go this way is because when the patient swallows and the patient talks, uh, it'll, this catheter or needle will move with, it, with the patient. Uh, and also, uh, if you go this way, you have the potential injury not of the jugular vein, but your catheter tip going right into either the, the, the nerve, which would be right here, or the esophagus, which, and that would be a disaster. So in, in, the, in some of these series where they're you know, having a lot of complications, when you go back and look at these series, you, you find that they were doing, they, a lot of these complications were reported uh, before they switched to the trans technique. The only, the only issue that I have with the transismus technique, it's sometimes hard to get to, to this part right in here. And so this is an area of protection. You do it, you leave, you leave it untreated intentionally to avoid injuring the nerve. But sometimes uh, if, the, if the nodule's way out here, it's, it's still really hard to get to that. So you might leave a little tissue right along there. But, but typically patients uh, get so much significant volume reduction from the whole thing that it really doesn't matter that much. So, and again, you have these concentric areas of treatment that you start down here and, and they get bigger and bigger as you go up and you just basically keep repositioning the, the, the probe as you go higher and higher. All right, and this is the, this is the generator here that we use and the generator uh, uh, basically allows you to adjust the watts, which, which is the, uh, the watts right here. So you start in a, with a low power and you kind of move it up as the patient tolerates it. And then you also measure the resistance of the electrical resistance, which changes as the tissue becomes more more heated up. So if you if you go into an area where you've already treated it, it the resistance is going to be very high. Um, and then there's also uh, foot pedals and that sort of thing, which which are for controlling it. So the catheter itself is uh, the part that's disposable, and that has the cooling temperature, and that and that cooling goes all the way out to the tip of it. And so there's two companies that make this, and, 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 and um, uh, they both, both basically look, look kind of the same. Um, so this is the setup, and um, I, I don't know if anyone else is doing it differently than this, but basically you sit at the head of the patient, and, um, and then you treat the patient. You have the ultrasound in one hand and the probe in the other. And obviously, if you're treating the, the left side, you, you've got the probe in the right side, and your ultrasound's on the left side, and you have to be ambidextrous for this. And then you have the, uh, the, uh, the generator at the foot, so you can see the numbers while you're doing it. Uh, you have these grounding pads on the patient's thighs, and then you have the water pump, and this kind of keeps the, the, the catheter warm. And there's the foot switch. So, and then in this situation, I have my ultrasound on the side of the, uh, of the lesion that I'm treating because you get kind of a kink in your neck. So, so here we are. This is actually uh, me doing it on my second patient. And uh, Rudy took this picture. And I had a TV that we set up right next to the patient's bed. And, and I, I have a separate TV from the, you can use just your ultrasound. Uh, but I, I thought that my uh, assistants would, would help you know, control the ultrasound and they could basically kind of stay behind me and then keep this uh, this uh, television right in front uh, for me so that way um, they can get to the numbers and they can get to the screen and controls to, to adjust the ultrasound if necessary. So, all right, so the, the advantage of this clearly are no scar, uh, minimally invasive, which is basically non-invasive, 
uh, no hospital admission, uh, you know, no registration. Uh, they, they go to work the next day. I have them come to my office and for a quick ultrasound and then they go to work. Uh, it's all under local anesthesia, which has its own issues. Uh, and, um, uh, and basically, it's, it's easy for the patient to endure. Most of them comp compare it to going to the dentist. <clears throat> um, and the results really have been terrific. And, uh, and, and if you're not happy with, with the results, you can do it again if you need to. Um, but it, it is expensive, so, so if you're going to offer that, you, you're going to eat the cost of that second treatment, I suspect. But, but, um, but they're doing a lot of redos when you go to other countries and watch the uh, people doing the procedure. Uh, they're often doing patients that have been done before, and those patients are coming back for either a touch-up or a recurrent disease that's gotten worse in other nodules uh, that, were, that were not treated on the first try. So, and the best part about it is they don't become hypothyroid. So patients who had normal thyroid function coming in and also who do not have uh, antithyroid antibodies uh, are going to maintain their thyroid function. So it's a good idea. We check the antibodies to make sure that they're uh, normal to begin with, just so we can counsel them appropriately. Because if they have high antibody titers, chances are they're going to lose their thyroid function no matter what. <clears throat> and uh, it says no complications, but, but I mean, there are complications. Uh, it just so happens that the, the complications are a fraction of surgery. So, so and, and uh, we're going to go through that. So. These are the compli these are the reported complications, and I don't have my complication rate on one side, and I didn't think about that till today. But but basically, these are the reported uh, after you know thousands of cases in, in multiple uh, series, and they just combine the data. But the voice change is only one percent. Now, voice change after surgery is reported at twelve percent, and, and that's not permanent. That's just that's just right after surgery, uh, and then so we certainly see a difference there. Uh, the hematoma is very low. Uh, we do poke these probes right through the sometimes the anterior jugular veins without knowing it. So it, you, you know you can get a hematoma, but 1% is pretty low. Uh, vomiting is really uh, more so associated with the uh, local anesthetic. Uh, skin burn, you've got to watch the catheter as you withdraw the catheter to make sure that the, uh, uh, that the generator isn't on, but you can definitely burn the skin on these superficial lesions. Um, the, when you get down to the brachial plexus injury, these are patients who actually had recurrent cancers treated when they're trying to get these lymph nodes out of there. These are not the primary benign nodule patients that we're seeing. Now the tumor rupture is something that I've seen and it, it really is inconvenient. Uh, the patient will come, will call you about six, seven weeks afterwards saying they felt a pop in their neck and their neck got suddenly swollen and it actually is their own a response to the devitalized tissue that their body now recognizes that as foreign, and it'll it'll it looks like an abscess truly uh, on the in the patient's neck. They get tremendous inflammation, and um, in Dr. Valcalvi at his conference they discussed this in Milan where they treat it with high dose steroids and they get significant improvement in symptoms. Uh, my first patient who had this, I was worried that she had cancer. I really was, and um, and the patient couldn't get steroids because she just recently found out she was pregnant. So, so we just treated expectantly and it slowly and slowly got better, but it took about two months. Now after two months, I will tell you that her nodule shrank tremendously after that. And so she was delighted with the amount of shrinkage she got, but clearly the inconvenience of the, of the tumor rupture uh, was, uh, was quite problematic and worrisome because you think it's an, an abscess. You truly think it's an abscess. You send cultures, you put them on antibiotics, and uh, everything comes back sterile. So a hypothyroidism is reported, but I mean, it's exceptionally low. There's no definitive histology, so you really got to get it up front. And if you see nodules that you just don't like the way they look, you probably shouldn't treat them with this. You know, and that's the thing. Some patients want to be treated and you say, look, you just, you just, it's just a bad idea. Because every time you look at them, it's going to be worrisome. The, the patients who have this treat treatment and they get follow-up ultrasounds. The tumors truly look worse after the fact. They look like cancers after you treated them. So you have to kind of tell them up front that they have to know where they're getting treated or followed up with ultrasound because they're, the, the appearance of those nodules are going to make them look very concerning to the to the radiologist. And so they're going to come back with a TIRAD5 for sure on their follow-up imaging. So. <clears throat> Uh, of course, you can get incomplete nodule ablation, and you can get treat a growth around the edges of the nodules, uh, which which sometimes is a problem or a concern. Uh, if you don't treat the nodule uh, completely, 
and you get these nodule regrowth. Some patients uh, will get biopsies and in, and in certain series, like say in Japan, they've reoperated on some of these patients just because they get indeterminate biopsies the second time when they see this nodule regrowth and, and, and they've taken these patients back and, and they've reported it that, that they've seen no problems with surgery in terms of the difficulty of surgery uh, and none of them were cancer, but, but they took them back because of the concern. Uh, and obviously the surveillance problem I just talked about. So you still have a residual thyroid mass. It doesn't go away. It just shrinks a lot. So <clears throat> the contraindications, uh, some of these are relative, but I mean, truly, if you have a serious heart problem, you know, that's not the best patient to do. But I will say that the, uh, the, um, uh, the most interesting case I heard about doing RFA on was someone who had amy amiodarone toxicity and was in fulminant heart failure. And the guy was so sick that they couldn't operate on him, and so they actually did RFA on his thyroid in the ICU uh, to ablate his thyroid, and, and, he, and his heart failure improved. And that was at the uh, Mayo Clinic in Rochester. And so that was that's pretty fascinating. So uh, obviously if they have contralateral, contralateral vocal cord palsy, you're not gonna wanna do anything on them really, but, but, um, but that's, a, that's still relative, but it's, it's, it's probably a bad idea. And substernal thyroid nodules, actually there's, there's a lot of guys who are doing these, but the problem is that you can't see all the way down into the chest because the clavicle gets in the way and blocks your ultrasound images and you just can't get the whole nodule. Uh, some people stage these, they do the top part of the nodule and as the nodule shrinks, then the rest of it will kind of come up out of the chest and then they'll do the second part later. But again, that's expensive and that's somebody who's really motivated to avoid an operation and I, I would usually just uh, recommend to uh, operate on these. Uh, follicular neoplasms are not appropriate, obviously, and neither is cancer. So, um, so when we see patients and that after they've been appropriately screened for pathology and you know, the size of the nodule, that sort of thing, uh, we get symptom scores on these patients, and I do a one to ten, where one is no symptoms and ten is the, the worst you can imagine, and then the cosmetic score I'll show you in a minute is based on how it looks to the naked eye. Uh, and then these are the tests that we generally do. So uh, obviously the pathologic diagnosis is a very important, uh, if you, you can do just one core needle biopsy. If you can get one core needle biopsy, that's better than two, two uh, FNAs. Uh, and then uh, if they have an autonomous functioning nodule, you just need one. All right, so uh, if someone comes to me and they have an AUS or FUS, then I'll do a core needle biopsy and then we'll just kind of make decisions based on that. So, all right, so uh, clearly if they, you want to look at their ultrasound to make sure that they, they don't have any other problems with it. What I've noticed doing these procedures is that patients have got calcifications in the thyroid. When you're doing the ablation and your probe goes under those calcifications, suddenly you don't see where the tip of that probe is. And so that, that can be a problem, particularly on the edge. Of, if you got a calcification on the edge of a nodule and you got to get underneath it, you, you may not be able to completely ablate that. So you just need to know that up front. And obviously the, the position of the nerve is helpful and the position of the, the, the nodule next to the nerve is, is important to evaluate. So uh, we always measure the nodule volume because that's what they use, that's what we're using to, to judge or to, to evaluate our success afterwards in addition to the patient's symptoms. So. Uh, Again, the, the symptom score we talked about, is, it's one to 10, not zero to 10. And then a cosmetic score is basically, if, you, if it's a one, you can't feel it, which is sometimes you get that after the ablation. Uh, if it's two, you, basically you can feel that edge just on palpation. Uh, three is basically, all, you can see the nodule moving around when they swallow, but when they're not swallowing, you don't see it. And uh, so we've had patients who came in as a four, and now they're down to a three now. Uh, and then four is just an obvious problem. So this is me in Brazil doing this procedure. This is my first one. And, uh, and they were just using that little screen right there. They had this one, and they, there was a huge screen right here, but the picture was so bad that, that we weren't even looking at it, but that's what they were, you know, they had. And I, I like the setup, I just need, we just needed a better TV there. So, and then, um, this is just you know what what I do. Uh, I do the proceed. I do an ultrasound. I measure it again on the day of the procedure, and then I have them come back the next day just to make sure everything looks good. And I look at the vascularity of the of the thyroid. And this is somebody that's had you know an ablation. It doesn't have any. I don't know how well you can see that, but um, it doesn't have any internal blood flow. We remeasure it 
in a, in a month and go over the symptom scores. We measure at three months. Usually by three months, all their symptom scores go down to one. So sometimes at one month, they still have some symptoms, but by three months, it's shrank enough where they just don't have any symptoms at all. So everyone's down to one by three months. And then we measure at six months and 12 months. So uh, some patients swear they're gonna come in for all these, but then we found that they don't do that, so. All right, so this is, um, this is the video. Now, how do I, here, I'm gonna start this. And, um, Do you know how to start this, Rudy? On this. So. I don't know if I just push, click or something. Yeah, what's that? Let me go back. Nope, go back. Okay. Nope, I won't. Can you? It's weird. Let's see. Let me go back. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> There's no play button there. Oh, here it is. Okay, good. There it is. All right, thanks. You gotta use the. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Did it start? Um, just hit play again one more time. Yeah. Let's move it. Cannot play media. It's giving an error message that you can't. Oh, play. really? Yeah. Oh, that sucks. Why? It worked on mine. Huh. Um, yeah. It's huh. probably because we saved it in a USB and you had a file probably somewhere else mm. that was connected to it on your computer. I, I, I Bummer. Yeah. Well, shoot. Well, I'm going to put this online. So I had a, a video just showing you kind of how the patients tolerate it. And uh, it's surprisingly well how well it's tolerated because um, uh, once it's numb, uh, the patients are just looking around and they're waiting for something to happen. They feel a little sensation in their neck, but it's not painful. And you know they'll they'll oftentimes you know make a sound and and uh, uh, and then they'll say oh but but you know sometimes they're startled but generally you ask them are you having pain and they'll say no not at all so uh, maybe I'll just hook this up in my I can't hook this up to mine so no no we could probably show it afterwards you know on mine yeah yeah yeah, yeah just when we um, yeah yeah I mean yeah. just put it over there I'll yeah play it so and then. Um, so anyway, these are my, uh, so the results basically, these are the, the, the re results that are reported in the, um, uh, in the um, world literature uh, in, a multi in these uh, large mega-analysis articles. And basically the, the one month uh, volume reduction, which is how much it shrinks, is 40%. Three months it'll be 61%. And then at six months it's, it's 76%. And so that's, that's all the literature long before I started. And so, um, uh, and then this is this is my data. So I did 14 last year, and uh, the mean volume was 32 mLs, which is pretty big. Uh, and uh, you know the m majority of the patients that I saw tr uh, had really big nodules. And um, the smallest was you know 3.6, which is small, but it was right in front, right right in front of the trachea. And you know, and I'll show you her picture. Uh, and the largest was 80. I mean, it was just gigantic. And they all did quite well. Uh, and you know who would think that a 68 year old woman would want to have this done but she was sick of being hyperthyroid all the time and she had a big nodule and she said I, I just want this taken care of and she was delighted to have normal thyroid function afterwards so and this is my these are my graphs showing that the significant reduction you can see that this uh, that our uh, my data basically mirrors that 40 percent amount of the volume reduction on these patients because this one this is the first month and this is almost you know 75 percent reduction here and so we have a whole uh, list of sh people and then we follow them out and some some are a year out they've come back just in time for us to measure them and um, but you really see a tremendous this patient uh, had had an ultrasound done out away from she lived in Alaska and so she had an ultrasound done in Alaska but she did have a lot of edema around her uh, she had a very large isthmus nodule, and she had a tremendous amount of inflammation around there. Uh, but now I just saw her on the on the you know through a Zoom meeting, and now it looks like a little marble in there. So it's a, it's it's shrank considerably since that time, but we don't have her repeat data. So you know so basically it's uniformly effective in shrinking these nodules. So all right so. This is, and this is just uh, before and after. What I, I've learned a lot about these, these uh, ultrasounds because what I would do is I would 
zoom in on my pictures to fit the size of the nodule. And so the, every nodule that I would take in my follow-up photos looked exactly the same size because I'd zoom in. So on the on the on the oops, on the um, on the right, it would be five centimeters. On the left, it'd be four centimeters or three centimeters. Uh, but basically, you can look at the top, the numbers here, and these, this nodule shrank. This is the gentleman with the autonomous functioning nodule, and he shrank uh, considerably uh, within 103 months. And then this is him, and so he went from 41, almost 42 mLs, all the way down to nine. But also, he was he became youth thyroid, so so he was delighted about that. Now his nodule is somewhere about six and a half, so it's even smaller. Um, and this is another woman who had a very large nodule that was visible, and causing her tracheal deviation, and uh, her started off to be quite large. And this is follow-up; it's it's a lot. And, and you guys know some of these patients, by the way. And then. Uh, this is a longitudinal. See, I couldn't even get the longitudinal picture on this. It was too big, uh, but it was, you know, uh, you know, this was uh, this is report. This is six centimeters this way, and then this one here is, yeah, three point six five. So it shrank considerably afterwards, um, uh, and then this is the neck here bef be before and then after. It's not really exact, but you can see the significant swelling. Right, right in this general area here, and afterwards you can't see anything. And then again, she has actually tracheal deviation to the right on this picture, uh, and you know a large area here which is now resolved completely. So, and then this is that smaller one. And when she swallows, I don't know how well this is projecting, but when she swallows, um, uh, you can see it. So she's not. She actually smiles a lot, but she's swallowing, so it makes it look like she's frowning. But um, but her nodule was right here, and it, sh it shrank considerably. And, and she never came back for her three month or her six month. And so this is this is a small. One. This one's only like four mLs in size, but it was just very conspicuous to her. Uh, and this is another patient. This is at, before the treatment, and three months later, and she got considerable improvement in hers. And then and then I have another one here. So. The, but the, uh, well, the, I guess it's somewhere else. So, uh, but basically the future applications for this is number one, because it's so easy to do, it's gonna be start, you're gonna start using it a lot. And uh, some of these applications are gonna be, be possibly using it for basically small cancers where the patients don't wanna be surveyed over the years, they just want something done but they don't necessarily want surgery. I don't know if the data's out on this, they've published some data in China already on this, and, uh, but we don't really have any studies in the United States that are meaningful yet. And so currently I'm not offering this. Uh, and it needs to be done in a trial situation. Um, uh, and then parathyroid tumors, you can do this. Uh, again, if you're young and healthy, I'm just gonna tell patients it's a bad idea because they're likely to get recurrence. Uh, but if for any reason there's a contraindication for surgery and it's sitting way out and way away from the nerve, then it's reasonable to do. But again, I'm not convinced that they're not gonna get recurrence of that process and that in the, you don't wanna cause parathyromatosis. So uh, this is the meeting that I went to. The next meeting is uh, going to be, this is the uh, people all around the world who do this get together and talk about this. The next one's going to be in Barcelona in January of next year. And this is the other one that was out of, out of order. Uh, this lady had an 80, almost 80 centimeter nodule and significant symptoms of choking and couldn't sleep at night. And hers, uh, within three months, you know, shrank dramatically. So she's delighted. So that's this talk.